In this lesson, we're going to be solving radical equations, identifying extraneous solutions, and solving real-life problems involving radical equations. A radical equation is an equation that contains a radical expression with a variable in the radicand, or inside the radical. To solve a radical equation involving a square root, first use properties of equality to isolate the radical on one side of the equation, then use the following property to eliminate the radical and solve for the variable. So down here, this says, if two expressions are equal, then their squares are also equal. So in algebra, it's if a equals b, then a squared equals b squared. And that makes sense, because if I square both sides, I'm doing the exact same thing to both sides, so the value is going to be the exact same. So that makes sense that their squares are going to be the same. All right, so for example one, we're going to be solving these equations. So first, for part a, I have the square root of x plus 5 equals 13. Well, first thing I'm going to do is get rid of this plus 5, because I want to isolate this radical with the x in it, and then I can square it on both sides to solve. So anyway, I'm going to do... I'll rewrite the equation. I subtract 5 on both sides. Square root of x equals 8. And then what I'm going to do is square both sides because, if you remember, the square root and the square, both those operations cancel each other out. So I'll just get x equals 64. So now we're done with part A. If I go over to part B, 3 minus the square root of x equals 0. Well, first thing I'm going to do is get rid of this 3. So I could subtract 3 on both sides. I also could have added the square root of x on both sides. It doesn't matter either way. Anyway, I get the square root of x equals negative 3. Well, what I can do here is I could divide by negative 1 to cancel out this negative. But notice, if I square both sides, the negative times the negative is going to be a positive. So that will cancel that out either way. So I'm going to square both sides. So this is all going to cancel out and become x is equal to 9. Okay, and if you wanted to check your answer, what you could do is just plug this back in. Well, I'll plug in 9 for x, so 3 minus the square root of 9. Well, the square root of 9 is 3. 3 minus 3 does equal 0. That works. Then here, if I do, okay, the square root of 64 is 8. 8 plus 5, that does equal 13. Anyway, I've solved both of these equations, and I checked my answers, and now we're done with this one. For example 2, we're going to solve the equation 4 times the square root of x plus 2, all plus 3, is equal to 19. Well, first thing I want to do is isolate this radical expression. So I'm going to copy the equation down. And I'm going to get rid of this constant term that's being added to my radical expression. So I'm going to subtract 3. I get 4 times the square root of x plus 2 is equal to 16. Now I'm going to divide both sides by 4 because this 4 is being multiplied by my radical. So to cancel multiplication, I can use division. And I get the square root of x plus 2 is equal to 4. Now I'm going to square both sides so I can cancel out this radical. So I get x plus 2 equals 16. Then I'm going to subtract 2 on both sides. I get x is equal to 14. And now we're done with this one. All right, so I'm going to solve the equation. The square root of 2x minus 1 is equal to the square root of x plus 4. I'm just going to rewrite it. Okay, and now what I want to do is I want to square both sides because if I square both sides, that will cancel out both radicals and then it will kind of unlock the variables to manipulate and figure out what the x value is. That makes this equation true. So I'm going to square both sides. So I just am left with 2x minus 1 equals x plus 4. And now to solve this equation, I'm going to subtract x on both sides and add 1 on both sides. And I'm going to get x is equal to 5. And now we're done with example 3. For example 4, we're going to solve the equation the cube root of 5x minus 2 is all equal to 12. Well, the logic here is very similar to when we're solving square root equations, but instead of squaring to cancel it out, I'm going to be cubing both sides to cancel this out. So I have the cube root of 5x minus 2 is equal to 12. First thing I'm going to do is cube both sides. And if you don't know what 12 cubed is, you can do 12 squared, which is 144, times 12, and multiply this out. I get 288, 4, 4, 1. So I get 1,728. And then over on this side, this is going to cancel. So I get 5x minus 2 is equal to 1,728. Now I just solve this like a regular equation. So I'll add 2 on both sides. 5x is equal to 1,730, 
and I'm going to divide 5 on both sides. I can do that out, or you could use your calculator. So 5 goes into 17 3 times, I get 15, 23, 5 goes into 23 4 times, 20, and 35 goes into 36 times. So x is equal to 346. So now I've solved this cube root equation, and now we're done. Identifying extraneous solutions. Squaring each side of an equation can sometimes introduce an extraneous solution. Now, we've actually seen extraneous solutions before when we've been talking about absolute value equations, and they behave in the same way that they do when we're talking about square root equations. So, I have the equation down here. x is equal to the square root of x plus 6. Well, there's no way that I can just solve this equation right now because this, this x right here is kind of trapped on, underneath the square root, and this one's not. But what I can do is I can square both sides, and then I won't have any square roots left. So that's what I'm going to do. Square both sides. So this is just x squared equals x plus 6. Well, now this is a quadratic equation. So what I'm going to do is get all my variables onto one side. So x squared, and then if I subtract this x, subtract the 6, I get minus x minus 6. And there's all sorts of ways I can solve quadratic equations, but I'm going to just check to see if this is factorable, because that might be the quickest way. And I notice that my two values need to multiply to negative 6 and add to negative 1. Well, if I have negative 3 and 2, those two numbers will add to negative 1 and multiply to negative 6. So I'm going to break this up. So x minus 3, x plus 2. And if you did a quick FOIL, you'd see that when I multiply these, I get negative 6, and I have a negative 3x, and then a positive 2x, that would give me that negative x, and then x times x is x squared. Anyway, right away, I can tell that my x values are going to be x equals 3, or x equals negative 2. Now, you might say, great, I got my two x values, and I can move on. I have two solutions here. But notice, I have, in my equation, x is equal to the square root of something. Well, if I'm taking the square root of any real number, a negative number is never going to pop out of this, because remember, this is the positive square root. So this is saying that the positive square root of something is going to equal a negative number. So negative 2 is actually an extraneous solution, because I have to reject it, because it doesn't make any sense when I plug it back in. So my only solution after I rejected negative 2 is just x equals 3. So I don't even need the or here. x is equal to 3. That's our only solution for example 5, and now we're done with this one. For example 6, we are going to solve the equation 13 plus the square root of 5n equals 3. Copy that down. Well, what I would do first to solve this is subtract 13 on both sides. Then I have the square root of 5n is equal to negative 10. So what you might want to do here is square both sides, and then you get 5n is equal to 100, and then divide 5, and you get n equals 20. But notice, before I squared both sides here, I had the square root of 5n equals negative 10. I'm taking the square root of something, and I'm saying that when I take the positive square root of something, a negative number is going to pop up. So this 20 right here is actually an extraneous solution. So I'm going to reject that. And the reason I'm going to reject that is because there's no solution to this equation. There's no real number I can plug in for n to make a negative number pop out of a positive square root. So this is no solution. And now we're done with example 6. Example 7. The period p in seconds of a pendulum is given by the function p equals 2 pi times the square root of l over 32, where l is the pendulum length in feet. A pendulum has a period of 4 seconds. Is this pendulum twice as long as the pendulum with a period of 2 seconds? Explain your reasoning. Well, first what I'm going to do is plug in 4 for p and then solve for l, and then I'm going to plug in 2 for p and then solve for l, and then we're going to compare those. So I have 4, that's my period, time, 4 seconds, equals 2 pi times the square root of L over 32. First thing I'm going to do is divide 2 pi on both sides. So this gives me 2 over pi equals L over 32, and that's in the square root. And then I'm going to square both sides. So I have 4 over pi squared equals L over 32, and I'm just going to multiply 32. Well, this is going to give me 128 over pi squared. 
this is L equals 128 over pi squared. Now you could put this in a calculator and plug this in if you wanted to, you actually don't need to. I'm gonna do the exact same thing, but instead of having four as my period, I'm gonna go back to two, because that, that's the second one that we're gonna compare. So now this is two equals two pi radical L over 32. Then I'm gonna divide by two on both sides, two pi I should say, or multiply by the reciprocal of two pi, which is one over two pi. Either way, I'm gonna get one over pi equals the square root of L over 32. Square both sides to cancel out the square root symbol, right here. So I get one over pi squared equals L over 32. And then I'm gonna multiply 32. And I get L is equal to 32 over pi squared. Now notice, to get from this right here, 32 over pi squared, to 128 over pi squared, I would just have to multiply by four because four times 32 is 128. So if we look back at the question, this is not twice as long. This is actually four times as long. It's because I'm gonna end up squaring both sides and because I'm squaring it, it's not gonna be twice as long for a period that's twice as long. It's gonna be twice as long squared. So twice as long squared would be four times as long. So the length of the four second period pendulum is four times as long, not twice as long. So anyway, I used this formula and what we know about square root operations to figure out how many times longer the pendulum with a period of four seconds is compared to the pendulum with a period of two seconds, and now we're done.